Today's video focuses on the SCSI ID selector switch found on the back of Apple's hard disk SC series drive enclosures. I'm going to show you how I connected a more modern 3.5 inch SCSI drive to that ID selector. These drives are neat because they're called zero footprint models which fit directly beneath a Macintosh Plus, Macintosh SE, SE30 or Classic series computer offering fast supplementary storage. You can also find them on eBay today. The original Apple HD20SC included a 5 quarter inch Seagate ST-225N drive mechanism. Those old drives were loud, only offered 20 megabytes of storage, and today have questionable reliability. Later versions of the HD20SC included a 3.5 inch full height Miniscribe 8425SA 20 megabyte mechanism. Enclosures also came in 40 and 80 megabyte versions too. I acquired this 20SC drive back in the year 2004. The seller at the time uh, did not sell me a hard drive to go inside because apparently the original drive had failed at some point, so he only sold me the enclosure which included the power supply. I at the same time purchased separately through an ABA seller uh, an IBM DGHS 4.5 gigabyte server drive. This particular drive is extremely reliable despite having been made in the year 1999. Also, it's a bit quieter on the years than the original Seagate and Miniscribe drives were, although it is by no means quiet compared to the almost dead silent SATA drives that you can find today. This drive is very fast and is more than adequate if you use it with even an accelerated SE30 computer. The issue we're looking at today is how to connect uh, this particular drive and really any modern drive that's SCSI like it uh, to the stock cabling that's inside. Now power is extremely easy and so is SCSI. It just drops right in. And even the LED connector is fairly straightforward if you build yourself a little adapter which is not difficult. The issue though is connecting the SCSI ID connector and it takes more thought and that's why I've never really wanted to deal with it until now. By the way, I'm not covering flash drive solutions like the SCSI to SD simply because number one, I don't have one and therefore I cannot speak from personal experience on it. And number two, those SCSI to SD drive solutions, they take power from the bus, which means you probably wouldn't even need to connect this power supply if you did want to mount it inside. And they also have up to four different SCSI IDs that you can set using software. What that means is they don't have pins available for you to connect any of these cables to, so there's really not a whole lot of meaning to put one inside this, so I'm not going to be talking about those today. Until now, I've been using my IBM drive without any SCSI ID jumpers installed at all. And when you do that, it sets it automatically to SCSI ID 0. That hasn't been a problem because I've been using it until now with SE30s that have not had any hard drive internal to the SE30 and normally you want to have your internal drive set to SCSI ID 0. So there wasn't any conflicts. But recently I tried to connect this drive at the same time as another hard drive that was mounted internal to my SE30 and it wouldn't boot because of the SCSI ID conflict. The internal drive was set to SCSI ID 0 like it should be, but this also was set to SCSI ID 0. The drive enclosure itself is not easy to open and close, and it's also a little bit fragile with the little plastic connectors on it. So I wanted to solve this problem once and for all by allowing me to be able to select on the fly the SCSI ID of my choice. Now just to let you know there is a keyboard shortcut that you can choose a drive to boot from by pressing shift, command, option, delete, and the number of the ID you want to boot from. However, that keyboard shortcut will not work if you have a SCSI ID conflict on the bus. This assembly is easy. You just push up or out this way on this little plastic tab so you can take out your power supply, you're going to have to disconnect your fan here and then once you get the drive out you can disconnect the power supply all the way. But to get the drive out it's just an easy matter of pushing on this tab and lifting up to take out the drive sled. And then you can disconnect power here and you've got your SCSI cable that you can disconnect here. 
On the bottom of this lead there are four screws that you need to take out to remove your hard drive. Now you can better see with the hard drive removed from the sled what I've done here. I have connected using this cable. This cable is just some spare wire that I had that just so happened to be conveniently in a ribbon cable form but what you're going to need to have is four wires basically and I connected from this point to the appropriate point on my drive and of course over here is just the LED. Now this is the cable that you would normally connect to the original stock Seagate or Miniscribe drive. This connecting, the green part connecting towards the back connector and this connecting to the matching pair of pins on the drive mechanism itself. So the green connector normally connects here. But you can see what I've done is, because these pins on the back here just go straight through, I put my four wires and connected one wire to each of the pins here because we're not able to use this stock connector. So what I did was is set my digital multimeter to continuity. Continuity means when you touch both probes you get a beep. And then I would check you can see that the topmost pin is spaced farther apart than the bottom three and that's because the topmost pin is common. You're always going to get that. And then what I did is I changed the SCSI ID. Right now it's set on one. So we're going to see what does pin one connect to at this point. And then I went down this pin, nothing, this pin, nothing. Oh, it's the bottom pin. And I would do that for each change of the SCSI ID. And doing all those checks enabled me to create this little rough hand-drawn diagram here which shows the connectors you saw me just testing and when the SCSI ID is set to zero that means that A is not connected to B, C, or D. Uh, by the way these are my naming conventions I just decided to call the topmost one A and B and C and D that's just the way I chose to do it nothing special about it. So none of these are connected to each other in the case of ID 0 in the case of ID 1 as I just showed you with the test, A and D, the topmost and the bottommost pin, are connected together, and so on. So what you can see here is for ID7, which is something you should not choose, by the way. Normally the MAC is ID7, but if you were to choose ID7, then you would have A, B, C, and D, all of them connected together, which means that uh, A is actually going to ground B, C, and D. So how did I know which of these four wires to connect to which pin, you ask? I went online and found this IBM DGHS drive data sheet. It's not specific to my 4.4 gigabyte drive, but it was close enough because these jumper pin positions on the drive, on my drive, match this data sheet. You can see here that it's actually missing a pin here, and that matched up very well with my drive. I also know, knew that what you see marked here as 0, 1, 2, 3, all of these are grounded, and I tested that with my meter to confirm. Uh, these are all grounded on the drive side, and then on, through testing with my continuity check, I found that this pin was B, what I call B, C, and D. And then, of course, I marked B, C, and D here for this uh, truth table. Now, there's a there's actually four pairs here and we only need three and the reason there's four pairs is because uh, on some of the drives it lets you change up to 16 SCSI IDs but we're not going to use that uh, on the Mac we're only going to go through 0 to 7 so we don't need to use pair number 3 we're only going to use pair number 0, 1, and 2 so again these on the bottom here these three are going to be A and then B, C, and D so we know from our truth table what we're going to get. So for SCSI ID 0, all are going to be off. And then for SCSI ID 1, we can see that it's D that is going to be connected to A, which means A is grounding D. That's what it means by on. And this is how I knew how to connect my four wires. So as you can see here from my 
soldering job. I didn't do anything fancy. I didn't use a connector. I just soldered the wire directly to the pins. And ultimately, you know, if I need to take it off, I can desolder that, and it's really not going to affect a connector from going on there. Now for the LED, which I did many years ago actually, I used a connector for this so it's easy to take, on, take off and put back on again. These are hardwired, which means they're not going to come off unless you put solder on it. But they're distanced far enough apart to where it's not going to be any concern that the wires are accidentally going to short over each other. Uh, perhaps I could have put some heat shrink tubing over that to cover it, but really for being inside this drive enclosure I'm not worried about it, so I think this soldering job is good enough, but you can do it better than I did if you so choose. By the way, if during opening the case you break one of the plastic tabs like I did, you may be able to fix it up uh, just fine with some JB Weld epoxy. It broke off at the top, so it actually broke into multiple pieces that I was able to fix the broken parts with that 24-hour epoxy. In preparation of changing the SCSI ID, you want to make sure that your back is definitely powered off, and I would suggest you just power off this HD20 as well uh, using the power switch over here, but as you can see, mine isn't even plugged in. Don't change the SCSI ID when it's connected to your Mac and your Mac is powered on. Also note that there's two SCSI connectors here in the back. These are Centronics connectors, and one, of course, connects to your Mac. It doesn't matter which is which is which one you choose. And the other connector you can use to connect to, say, another um, HDSC series drive or another SCSI peripheral. Just make absolutely sure that each of your SCSI drives has a unique ID. So right now we can see your SCSI ID is set to zero. Normally your internal Mac's hard drive is set to zero, so this would be a conflict. And changing it is easy. You just want to have a straightened paper clip or some piece of metal that's straight and you just push and it changes like so to one, two, three, four, all the way up to seven, but you don't want to choose that because that's the Mac. And if you press further, it has a couple blanks here. You don't want to leave it on those. And if you press it again, it reverts back to zero. So I'll go ahead and just set it on one. And I would suggest you, you would choose, um, well, you could choose anything between one and six. It really is your choice. Uh, and just to make sure you also get everything right, some drives require termination and sometimes uh, you would need to put an external terminator on if your drive doesn't have internal termination. Mine does, so I don't need an external terminator, but I just want to min mention that before we proceed. I'll start by powering on the drive. And then boot the Mac. By the way, if you're wondering what in the world this is, this is an SE30 inside a Mac FX clear case with a clear mouse. If you haven't seen my video on that, please be sure to check that out. So SCSI Probe is showing my internal drive is drive ID 0 and my IBM DGHS is ID 1. So now I'll shut down and change it to ID 4 and show you. And here we are, we can see the change here. SCSI ID4. Inside this particular SE30, I've got one of the fastest CPU upgrades available, the Daystar Turbo 40, 40 megahertz, latest ROM 4.11. This is truly wicked, wicked fast. All of the caches are on, so let's run some benchmarks on my DGHS drive and compare that with the stock drives. We'll start off with Snooper 2.0 by Maxa Corporation. This is uh, software from 1993. You can go up to the benchmark menu and you've got a variety of benchmarks here but we only care about the drive and my boot drive is just one of the partitions so I'll go ahead and do the read. And it says 1.47 megabytes per second. Do the write. And the average write is 2.53 megabytes per second. Now seek. Average 3.82 milliseconds. Now I sent some screenshots from Snooper 2 from Old Crap Vintage Computing, who kindly did this test for me on the Seagate ST225N. 
we can see here the average write time is 0.33 megabytes per second. Uh, quite a bit of a difference there. The read test got, uh, well, 0.33 megabytes per second. Hmm. And then we have the seek test, which, yeah, it's, it, the, the graph's way up there, 38.47 milliseconds. And again, this is for the Seagate. So I'll go ahead and just do the benchmark on my internal drive, which is set to SCSI ID0. This is my Quantum LPS 540S. It says FWB because I used FWB uh, toolkit to format the drive. We'll do the read. Average read 0.73. Mm, I want to do that again. Four eight, so it varies slightly each time you do it. Average write. Two point four nine. Seek. Is thirteen point one four. So it's kind of in the middle, but still better overall than the Seagate stock drive, but not quite as fast as my IBM DGHS. Next, we have Norton 3.5.3. This is System Info, the benchmark utility. Again, this is the Seagate that uh, old crap vintage computing sent to me. It has scored rock bottom, even below the Mac Plus. The Mac Plus, if we double click on it, we can see all kinds of data here. And if you scroll down, we can see the volume is a Quantum LP240S. So the Quantum 240S got a 26.3, but the Seagate ST225N got even lower than that at 24.1. And uh, again, we can see the inf information here. It says here Seagate ST225N. <laughs> so uh, quite low in performance. Lower still is this Norton benchmark from Ryan Zender, scoring a whopping 13.6. I will go ahead and do my drive. And we can see the test got a 142. This is just under Mac 2 FX Fast Disk. In the past, I've run benchmarks using different OSs. You can see the same drive got 155 at the time. And again, I put 40 megahertz. That means my Turbo 40 was installed. You can also see other benchmarks with OS 7.6. And uh, with my 50 megahertz demo, here's another one, 7.5.5. So it really varies based upon the OS you're running and um, whether you got 32-bit addressing on or off or something like that. But basically, the highest score I got is 174, which... Uh, uh, you can see beats a Power Mac 9600 200, which is <laughs> pretty incredible. So it kind of varies a lot in Norton, uh, just to let you know. But uh, even the lowest score that I got is still far, far beyond uh, that Seagate. Next, we're looking at speedometer. There are a variety of versions. Um, this is version 4. And this machine is getting 1.54 and by the way version 3.2.3 and version 4 are going to give you different scores than some of the earlier uh, 3.06 and earlier versions uh, quite a bit different numbers so just keep that in mind uh, when you are comparing with other machines but if we say compared to a 2SI uh, 1.54 is 1.8 times faster than the disk that was used in this Macintosh 2 SI. You can also see I've got some past. Um, 1.51 is roughly what I got this time. This was with my socketed 50 megahertz accelerator. Power Mac 6160, the disk is 1.7. So it gets um, about 1.1 times faster. Not a whole lot, but uh, it's faster. And the Quadra 950, it's actually it's slightly faster than the Quadra 950. So um, 
yeah, this it, the OS I'm running now is System 7.1, so it'll vary slightly, but Norton actually varies a lot more. So I would say if you're going to run benchmarks, a speedometer, and snooper are pretty good options for you. You can see here in the speedometer report that uh, old crap vintage computing sent me for his Seagate. It's got a disk score of 0 0.274. So all of the benchmarks are showing it's just rock bottom, the slowest thing possible, which is why if you can swap out that old hard drive, one of the stock Apple hard drives for a newer SCSI drive, even if it's not an SSD, you're going to get quite a bit faster performance. And last but not least, 68K MLA member GP Buno very kindly sent me the one and only Miniscribe 8425SA benchmark that I've received, and that was run on Speedometer 3.2.3 on his SC30 running System 7.5.3. As you can see, the score is 0.407, higher than the 0.274 that the Seagate got, but still less than a third of the performance of my IBM DGHS. All said, these 20 megabyte stock drives are not speed demons, and if you can swap them out with something faster, you should do it. And that's it. I hope this information was useful to those of you who either own or would like to own one of these nifty drive enclosures. And if you haven't seen my recapping video yet, please be sure to check that out because not only does it show you how to recap the Sony power supply inside the enclosure, but it also shows you how to properly open and close the enclosure as well, which is very important because it's somewhat difficult to do without a detailed guide. Next, I'd like to offer my humble and sincere thanks to two very kind individuals who contributed to this channel by PayPal in the month of July 2020. Thank you, John in California. Also, thank you, Daryl Johnson. Both of your contributions will go towards making this channel better. And if you'd like to join them, you'll find a PayPal link in the text description below. If you're watching this video on YouTube, what a text description is, is just right directly below this video. You click show more and it'll expand out and you'll see a lot of useful information there. I put those text descriptions under each and every one of my videos, things to buy, uh, data sheets and so on. So be sure not to miss that. If you like this video, I'd certainly appreciate a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please click the subscribe button. If you have any thoughts to share or questions, please be sure to leave those in the comment section below. I read and reply to every single comment under all of my videos, and I'm more than happy to engage you there. So thank you for watching. I wish each and every one of you a wonderful day.